Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Majestic's second market webinar. Uh, today I have Chris Billman to my left and Scott Peskowitz, who were with us last time. And we're fortunate today to have Alex Julanov from McKinsey. So Alex, go ahead and introduce yourself. We look forward to having a productive conversation, talking about the market, what's going on in the industry, and, and a few other topics today. Thanks, Todd. As a quick word about myself, I'm a partner in McKinsey, New York. I've worked in the metals industry for 20 years all over the world, and I co-lead our metals practice in North America. Just as a note to our audience, we welcome questions throughout the session and we'll be sure to follow up with thoughtful answers. As we step back, I think everyone agrees we're in a historical moment for metals prices and particularly for hot rolled coil and hot dip galvanized. All of our metals clients are full out. We know the data because you've talked about this before in other sessions in your weekly core report. Utilization is over 75 percent. Lead times are more than 10 weeks in some cases. And when you talk to the end customers, whom we also work with quite heavily, they all complain about not being able to find steel. So we're very interested today to hear what Majestic and its leadership team on these issues think about these topics and also to hear the questions from the audience. Let's turn just to a couple of examples. Building and construction, residential, commercial, industrial infrastructure, everyone's saying, how do I get my hands on more metal? And how do I ensure that a few months from now, there's still metal coming and I can see where it is in the supply chain? This has led to a real shift in the mind of the end customer. We're gonna put up a page which shows right now the future metals industry digitalized. It's a topic we talk about a lot with our clients. We know that Majestic is taking a leadership role in this space as well. What our clients who are the customers of distributors are asking about is where is the metal? When is it coming? How do I know what's happening from initial production to finishing to distribution to further finishing to arriving at the general contractor or the, or the construction site? So if we could show that page now, the first one would be great. So if we think about that page, what we find is that at the very bottom of it, there's a situation which affects the end customer, which is logistics and supply chain. We all know that consumer goods, whether it's the Amazons of the world or even 10, 20 years ago, the Walmarts of the world, moved to very fast real-time tracking of all of the products that they're selling. What's changing now is people in the metals industry, particularly in distribution, where a lot of the relationships have been phone or fax or face, are switching as well to a demand for digital services and digital support. And that's something we're working on very heavily. We're very interested to discuss that today as part of, the, as part of our group here. But let's maybe start at the most important question. And this is to Todd. How long can this party last? How long are we gonna see these crazy metal prices has anything changed in the last month to change to alter your view of the markets? Yeah, Alex, uh, the current market actually has gotten tighter over the last month, mainly due to supply chain disruptions and strong demand. So in the short term, we see supply, even with new capacity coming online, continuing to be restricted due to planned and unplanned maintenance and just the current global environment. Um, if you look at the market, we saw capacity utilization pull back significantly during COVID. And the mills are taking a different approach today. They're focusing on quality and value add over just bringing capacity online. And when you bring new capacity online, that takes time. It doesn't just ramp up overnight. Uh, at the same time, all of our end markets are strong. So from that perspective, we see greater demand than supply, and we think that'll continue into 2021. That gets me to a question for Chris, which is specifically end year. Do you think these prices, as Todd was saying, hold till the end of the year, or do you think there'll be any softening if A, there's perhaps some of this new volume coming online from restarts, and B, maybe a little bit more demand for imports? Any Anything that, that alters your view, or you're in line with what Todd said? Yeah, very much in line. Um, we all know that this market can't continue to go up forever. There's eventually going to be a point where it starts to pull back shortly. If you go back to August when the market bottomed originally and started to push higher, everybody was pointing to maybe December it being the peak. Then it moved to March. Now it's into June, into Q3. Um, if you look at the hot rolled coil futures market, uh, we're in a contango at least through June. 
um, and into Q3, as Todd mentioned, supply um, is only getting tighter. Um, there's been announced just in the last um, couple of weeks of over a million tons coming out um, in the second quarter due to maintenance, planned and unplanned. Um, and demand is strong. I think the issue with the auto is only kicking that down the road even farther. Um, instead of loading up the first half of the year, um, it's kind of spreading it out through the whole year. It's going to keep the supply chains tight. Um, prices are, we don't see anything that's pulling pricing back in the, in the near term and even uh, into Q3 and towards the end of the year. It's an interesting point about maintenance, uh, planned and unplanned. You talked about a million tons. There is about, let's call it, 7 million tons coming online in the next few months. So question for Scott, is that going to make any difference? I mean, it's all over the Midwest and South. It's in the border area with Texas. That's a decent amount of volume in restarts and also some of the, the new mills that are starting up either new lines or actually whole new mills. What's your view on that? Yeah, like you mentioned, there's 7 million tons um, of flat roll capacity coming online by year's end. Uh, however, as Chris mentioned, we have uh, planned outages over the next three months. So we have uh, Indiana Harbor, uh, U.S. Steel, Mon Valley, Middletown Works. Um, so we have all of these uh, outages coming out that really doesn't make up 100% of uh, the capacity coming online. Um, so we still see in the short term uh, numerous supply chain issues. Uh, and as Todd mentioned, a lot of these CEOs of these mills have tried to uh, make sure not to bring on too, too much capacity at once. Um, they're, like, like you mentioned, they're, over, they're going for quality over quantity. Um, just to no, try not to rush too many tons into the market all at once. Yeah, Alex, it's a, wanna, real, real quick on that, because it's a great question. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone is always trying to figure out when's the market going to peak, when's it going to turn, and what's going to drive that. And uh, one thing to, to note is there are a lot of buyers that rely on the spot market for their day-to-day -day needs. And there's no spot market right now when it comes to finding availability from the mills. And then we at Majestic have worked with many mills on startups. And um, ramping up a mill, uh, even if it's uh, slated for X amount of tons, the reality is they have to work towards that. Um, and we've seen you know, startups um, in the past that don't necessarily go as smooth. There's a lot that goes into them. So it doesn't mean that they will or won't. I just think that a lot of times we look at the market and, and see the numbers and we think that that's a, a perfect science and there's a real art to bringing capacity online, uh, taking capacity offline, doing maintenance, and then you know things that happen um, in the steel making process, which is a highly engineered product that you can't plan for sometimes. There's no spot market right now. Those are some pretty amazing words to hear if we looked back a year ago. Does that mean, and I guess I'll, I'll throw this to Scott again, does that mean that we might see more demand for imports that actually what has been an area where most uh, manufacturers have pushed back, maybe an area where customers want to pull forward and ask for more imports to be allowed in? What, what's your view there, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. We we all believe we need imports currently in this supply situation. Uh, like I mentioned, we're just there's just such a short uh, amount of tons out in the market. Uh, the main issue that we're seeing, though, is a lot of the import tons aren't coming into the market until June, July, later in the summer. Um, and again, we might have all of these tons come in, uh, even though they, they are more attractive, uh, possibly, uh, in terms of price. Um, again, we're going to see a lot of different supply uh, uh, issues going forward in the short term. It's an interesting world we live in, and from our perspective, because we look to and, and talk with also people in aluminum and other metals, it's the same everywhere. Um, one of the topics that some of the metals producers ask us about in carbon steel especially is scrap. And the question is, will the scrap supply be constrained? Already is, prices are up. We know that they, they track to HRC pretty closely, and will that also cause some problems with metal availability down the line? I mean, we're such a heavy electric arc furnace production profile in, in the U.S. or in North America more broadly. It's a real question if scrap is going to create another bottleneck upstream. And I guess I'd be curious what Chris thinks, because there's a bit of a debate when you talk to the analysts about what's coming over the next few years. Yeah, we're definitely in the, the view that scrap, the scrap market's only getting tighter specifically on the prime side. Um, if you think about prime scrap generation currently, 
A lot of that comes from the automotive market that's been subdued um, due to the chip semiconductor issue. Um, and all that new production that's coming online, almost all of it, if not all of it, is electric arc furnace um, who thrives on uh, prime scrap consumption. So as more and more steel production comes, comes online, there's going to be a higher appetite for scrap. Um, and as far as other grades, shredded and obsolete grades, that offshore market, particularly uh, with the opening up that China has done, allowing imports back into the country, um, it's just another end market that um, we're shipping scrap to as the number one scrap generator in the world um, that's leaving the domestic shores going offshore that could be consumed domestically. So at least through the end of this year, we don't see anything that's negatively impacting scrap pricing, um, scrap, higher scrap pricing. Through the end of this year is only going to be wind to fuel higher flat rolled finished steel pricing, hot rolled, coated. Um, so no, we don't, we, in the same ballpark, I think that you mentioned that we see stronger scrap pricing and it's only gonna get tighter um, as we move the next few years. We have a similar view. We've been looking at this for a while and I think our sense is that it will get tighter. It'll tighten considerably in two years out from now because a lot more mills will be online. Uh, the China import, we probably haven't seen it hit so hard yet, but it's something that over the next few months and years will, will occur. I guess a question I'm gonna throw to Todd is, is this going to change the balance of the scrap markets permanently? Because we're, we talked to a lot of furnace operators and they say, look, uh, we're definitely dipping into the obsolete. We definitely are trying to use lower quality scrap, but that has a big impact on the value and use of the products because, and it has a big impact on the cost of operating the furnace. So I guess the question is, do you think you're going to see more demand for direct reduced iron or its portable form hot briquetted iron and merchant pig iron in the market, uh, Todd, because scrap is becoming so constrained? Yeah, so I think I've been saying this uh, for, for a while that COVID was a, a worldwide reset and we're seeing a shift in the markets. And so if you're looking at the scrap market specifically, um, today in the U.S., over 70 percent of steel is made with an electric arc furnace. Uh, we're seeing a shift um, globally in terms of more EAF mills coming online. So we're going to see more demand for scrap worldwide. We've already seen that here in the U.S. And as Chris mentioned, um, the impact of the automotive sector is, is affecting the scrap markets. Uh, weather plays a role in it. We're seeing more extreme uh, circumstances in terms of, of weather. And so I think what you're seeing is the mini mills, um, which had uh, utilized scrap as a competitive advantage to their steel making are looking at alternative inputs. And, and we've already seen that with Nucor's investments in, in DRI um, or Nucor and Steel Dynamics buying, um, whether it's a scrap processor or multiple scrap processors or, or scrap dealers, um, or Cliff's now thinking about their investments in terms of how they're gonna be utilizing their production to be able to support mini mill production with, um, with alternative iron solutions. So I just think that uh, we're seeing a, a worldwide shift. One of the things that um, a lot of people aren't recognizing in the domestic market is that the global supply chains are just as, if not more, um, disrupted than the U.S. market. So, you know, you talk about, well, imports are going to come in and, and the price is lower. Um, you know, it's tough to rely on that. You know, we at Majestic rely um, on the domestic mills. And we always say that if the domestic mills uh, can't produce it or, or won't produce it, then we buy import. And we look at, you know, fair trade um, options. But it's tough. It's tough in terms of reliability. It doesn't mean that you, you know, we don't see that being a, a real option. Because, um, as Scott mentioned, we think it's a need. Right now, the current capacity we have here isn't going to support the demand, uh, especially you know, if, if oil prices continue to rise, if infrastructure bill gets passed, um, you know, what we need to do in the south after the, the, the freeze down there. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of demand on the horizon that's been deferred um, over the last 30 years, in my opinion. The very interesting point you raise, a lot of the steel producers and, and now the newly integrated cliffs have leaned in on producing alternates to scrap such as DRI and HBI. The strategic decisions made a while ago that are now uh, potentially paying off big. We'll be tracking that very closely. 
I want to come back to a scrap question. I want to raise a different issue building on what you said, Todd. So there's still a lot of independent scrap operators out there. I mean, we know that David Joseph and Omnisource and the rest have all made these alliances, but something we've been trying to understand better is what's going to happen to the small and mid-sized scrap players? Is, are, are they all going to be swallowed up? I'll, I'll throw this back to Todd because you commented on it. It was an interesting question. Do you think there's going to be a lot of consolidation and concentration in the, among the scrap producers, um, even more so than we've seen the last few years? Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of consolidation from the, the steel producers. And now, uh, naturally, the next wave is going to be scrap and, and service centers. Uh, it's, it's too fragmented right now. So, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, we believe that we're going to see the, the scrap um, market consolidate as well as the service center market consolidate naturally because you have restricted supply. So it's going to consolidate through the lack of supply. It's going to consolidate through lack of uh, succession planning. It's going to consolidate through attrition, um, which is a natural um, evolution based upon where we're at in, in the cycle. Um, so. The, the, the short answer is yes, it's a matter of how and when. Um, and and doesn't mean that there won't be, I mean, there's 12,500 metal service centers in North America. Um, I couldn't tell you how many scrap companies there are. Um, doesn't mean that there's not going to be a market for independent mom and pops, because uh, I think that's always a part of our culture here in terms of what drives the American economy. I just think that um, we're going to see that shift just like we're seeing in other markets. Will the consolidation mean that it's easier for your end customers to get metal? I mean, I, one of the points we want to raise in this discussion is what the distribution market is doing to help the contractors and the industrial companies and the fabrication shops and all the mid-sized businesses get a hold of their metal. Uh, how does consolidation play into that? It sounds like it's a multi-year trend and it's a very fragmented market still. Everyone knows who the big players are, but the truth is half the market is still small and mid-sized distributors. So let's say you see consolidation of another 10% or 15%. Is that going to make it easier or harder for someone who's trying to get metal in a metal-constrained market? Throw that back to Todd or, to, or, 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 or anyone else who wants to comment. I would say, if you, talking about fragmentation and consolidation, if you're looking to, if you're lacking a succession plan and you're looking to get out, um, the best time to do it for that company is when the market's good and I don't think you're gonna get a better market than now. So we might only see that accelerate um, back half of this year and into 2022. 20, and as far as um, getting that metal, it just puts further emphasis on partnering um, with companies that you can trust, that you know that can supply the material and not just going after the lowest price um, material in the market, um, the quickest grab you can get, it's building a combined plan um, with your supplier um, for not only today, but future market swings in the future. Interesting. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think one of the things, just going on your question about the supply chain and availability of metal, I think the, the biggest challenge we have right now is we don't have visibility to the supply chain. Um, and so when you don't have visibility in the supply chain, it's tough to know where the metal is and, and when it's going to arrive. Um, and in in the consumer world, as you mentioned, we have visibility into that supply chain. Um, and so when you don't have visibility, uh, it's an imperfect market, uh, which then creates these ebbs and flows in terms of oversupply, undersupply, um, as you know, demand is, is going to be what demand is. Um, and that's what you know, drives the market. So from a supply perspective, just having more visibility into the supply chain, whether it's through consolidation that you have stronger players that are able to get you product more uh, timely, uh, or it's you know, having greater visibility through new, new digital tools and solutions. I mean, that's how we have visibility into what we get into our homes, right? I mean, all day, every day uh, throughout COVID, I was getting a package dropped off uh, at my doorstep because I had visibility of you know, when it was coming, what was coming, and, and um, it was mainly because my wife was, was buying those packages, but um, at least I knew uh, and got you know, alerts and notifications. Um, you don't get that in steel. Uh, and so you don't have visibility. So you, know, you have lead times, but it's like, everyone's always looking for the easy answer and the one size fits all. But when you break it down, you know, the, the lead times are unique based upon every producing facility. So even within a company, you can't necessarily compare a lead time in Indiana versus uh, Alabama. 
um, it's a different producing facility. Or even with Majestic, we have different you know, service centers that we operate out of. So you really got to get down to the granular um, data and details of every transaction and situation. Yeah, adding to that, I'm on top of just following lead times, if you look at just general market information, we're at, say, 8 to 12 weeks on a lead time, but does that factor in the backlog that mills are still trying to work through? They may be three, four weeks behind on an order. Um, it depends, like Todd said, it's very specific. It depends on product, location, and, and market you're going to. So there's very um, lack of visibility into that, just using that one indicator as a particular key indicator of what's going on on the supply side. Yeah, those that generalize or commoditize um, are going to struggle in this environment because you cannot generalize. And the reality is, I've always said, this steel is a highly engineered product. Um, it's made with commodities, but it's not a commodity. It's a highly engineered product. There's a, a science to make it, and there's an art to managing the production schedule, the lead time, and the supply chain. So, um, you know, and I think that's, that's changing right now. It's decommoditizing, and you can't generalize. Very, very interesting point about decommoditizing, Todd. I think um, when we've been looking at the steel markets and other metals as well, and trying to see where there's innovation, if we don't name names, but we just step back a little bit, there is a lot more push to make transparent the supply chain or the equivalent of where's my stuff or when is my lift coming or my Uber coming. And we have a couple slides on this, and we're going to put up the first one which talks about metals players we've surveyed who've run digital programs. And what you'll see on this page, which is quite interesting, is that ef effectively everyone thinks digital is important, but only about half have really pushed hard in the last sort of one to three years with maybe about a sixth or a seventh pushing in the last year. So it's a little bit late to the party, but the advantage of coming late to the party is the people who are late like the party already know what the best products are to help them digitize, and there's already a lot of partnerships out there. And I think your point about the decommoditized product makes sense because when you do talk to an end customer, particularly when they have very specific needs in finishing, they want to know what's happening all along the supply chain, as we commented earlier. Where the challenge lies is in the next page we're going to show, which talks about how successful metals players have been in their digital programs. A lot of them are stuck. A lot of them are still scaling up. About half feel like they're realizing some impact. They're actually managing to free up some working capital. They've got more cash on hand. On the other half, they're stuck in the pilot and they can't get out of it. So I guess a, a broader question I would ask is where the potential partnerships can be in this digital space. If you're a metals producer, do you, do you want to partner with your distributors? Is there any opportunity to create a sort of cross distribution platform? I'll throw this back to Todd because I know you talk about this a lot. And then, then I think we'll, 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 we'll switch and talk about a few other topics that are related to the current metals market. So Todd on partnerships, digital uh, and the supply chain across metals to the end customer. Yeah, I mean, I think most companies focus on what they do best. And so if you don't build digital solutions as a core competency to your business, then that's not going to be a focus of yours. And the reality is to do that um, takes a lot. It takes a lot of talent, it takes time, um, and it takes investment, it, it takes dollars. And if you don't put that into your budget um, to be able to do that, then it's not gonna happen. So you either got to uh, invest in the talent, invest in the technology, invest in the time, and, and, and spend the money, or you gotta rely on somebody else to do that, right? So um, I, I believe in this sector, you know, it's funny because they talk about the technology sector and I say, well, the steel industry is the original technology sector. I mean, making steel is, is one of the most amazing innovations and inventions we've had. Um, however, it's really about the digital technology we're talking about. And so when it comes to digital technology, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into and I've learned the hard way in terms of building digital solutions that, uh, that don't work. Um, to then get to the spot to, to build digital solutions that do work. So, you know, at Majestic, um, we believe that digital is the way of the future. That doesn't take away from relationships. Um, relationships matter. People do business with people. But the digital allows you to do it more efficiently, do it more effectively, be able to track it, be able to have access to the data, make it repeatable. Because um, we're all busy, so, you know, making it easy is, is huge. So Majestic's invested in digital solutions. Um, 
really for our customers uh, and also our suppliers. You know, we, we look to partner um, with our suppliers and our customers. And then, you know, I'm not here to push anything, um, but we incubated um, a, a technology business and then spun it off. And it operates independent from Majestic today, which is a third-party platform um, called Felux. And there's a few others out there, too. So I'm not, you know, saying that that's just the right one for you, but you got to pick what's right for you. But um, what Felux is doing is, is creating a platform model to create efficiency, uh, to create visibility, to allow for those transactions to run through a system. A lot of people get confused. It's not looking to compete with other players in the market. It doesn't make steel. It, it doesn't uh, buy and sell steel. It doesn't process steel. It doesn't fabricate or manufacture. Um, the best analogy I can use is, is that it's a racetrack for the race cars that operate within the space. So, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, digital is the way of the future. Um, however, it's, a, it's, a, it's an evolution process to our operating businesses versus a replacement to it. Steel's a tangible product. So you're, you know, we're not going to live in a virtual world with steel. Uh, we, we make real things and we build real things. Um, so, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, the digitizing of the industry needs to happen sooner than later um, to create a more efficient supply chain. So that we're not picking up the phone asking our supplier where that steel is. And then they tell us um, that it's going to arrive on this day and then it doesn't arrive. And then we got to go back and play the game of telephone or, you know, working in emails with static reports that are uh, PDF versions of a status sheet that then isn't even real time by the time that you actually get it. Um, and so, you know, from our perspective, we believe that digital solutions are about efficiency. They're about visibility, they're about connectivity, um, and they're needed in a supply chain like steel. Yeah, adding to that super, super high level, like Todd mentioned, the digitization, this increases efficiencies, which allows for scalability. If you're looking to grow, um, I don't know how you're going to grow, whether it be internally or externally, when you're relying on John in the warehouse as your knows when the inventory is low to trigger for you to go buy without a system in place um, digitally that tells you, that automatically pulls that trigger for you and other numerous um, digital capabilities uh, throughout the supply chain. And look, it's, it's always worked until now, right? So it's like, okay, um, we found ways, you know, we, we used to meet face to face, then fax and, and over the phone, then, then email. And so, uh, and, and most buyers and sellers in this space have made it easy. Um, and the thing is, you're not a consumer, so you're not making the decision on behalf of yourself. When it's you know, deciding to take a taxi, a car service, or now an Uber or a Lyft, you're making that decision for yourself. Um, when you're making that decision for your business, there's a lot more that goes into that. Um, so it's who's going to make that call. But, but the reality is, by leveraging those solutions, um, it only is going to make your business better. Uh, and we live in a world of data. We live in a world of digital solutions, and, and to fight it, uh, I always say the next generation outlives the previous generation, no matter how um, you know, much you try to, to outlive the next generation. Um, and so it's only a matter of time, uh, and, the, and the time is now. Um, you know, we're, we're working remotely, we're relying on Zooms, we're relying you know, on virtual environments. So um, why not accept it, embrace it, and, and bring the industry forward, especially when you know, it affects your business. Um, uh, I, I believe price matters, but it's not the first thing that matters. Reliability is the first thing that matters, right? So I'm not saying that price doesn't matter. You can't take it out of the equation. You know, we're a buyer and seller of steel. We need to buy as well as we can. I think of it more like cost management versus price. Um, but, but the challenge is what good is a price if you don't have your steel? Or you don't know when it's arriving. Um, so knowing when it's arriving and knowing that you can get it is more important. And a digital solution helps in terms of the visibility as well as the right partner that has it. Let's stay with that for one more question because you, you have both raised some interesting points. And coming back to Chris's uh, reference to John in the warehouse, let's say you've got frontline sales in the warehouse that has worked traditionally on the very high human touch part of sales. The question I want to throw back to the group here is, how do you build the new capabilities to go digital in what has been a, 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 an industry that has innovated massively in engineering? To your point, Todd, steel has been at the forefront about thinking in the new chemical composition, new strengths, et cetera, of the end product. 
But on the digital side, it's been uneven. Some people have stepped forward, some people have st stayed back. It's not as consistent. One of the things that comes to us a lot in, in the work we do with clients is a big question is, okay, I'm really excited about digitizing my supply chain, but I don't have an army of data scientists and data engineers, and I can't afford to pay McKinsey for 10 years. You know, How do I build these capabilities? How do I teach people? And we actually sometimes spend more time on the implementation and capability building than, than getting the digital solution in because that's the only way it sticks. So I'm wondering from the perspective of a distributor, back to John in the warehouse, uh, to Chris's comment, how do we encourage people who are excited about digital to come into the steel industry and how do we get people in the steel industry excited about digital? And then we'll move to another topic after this, but this is a pretty exciting one. So I'll throw this back to the group, whoever wants to comment. Yeah, my first comment is without steel, there is no digital. So um, steel is, is at the epicenter of it all in terms of industry. You think about what steel builds in terms of cars, washers, dryers, homes, bridges, roads, uh, solar power, wind power, you know, pipe and tube, so I could go on and on. We in the industry all know that, so there is no digital without steel. Uh, and then the other thing is the industry just need to come together, right? So um, I, I go back to uh, us building and then um, creating now what is, is Felix. Uh, that is a, a hybrid steel slash tech company that's building a digital platform um, for the, the industry to be able to operate more effectively, to solve for workflow process issues, um, to make transactions more seamless and repeatable. Um, and so those are the type of solutions that are needed. You know, when we go to book travel today, right, um, we go to the Kayaks, the Travagos, the, you know, the Expedias, whatever that um, source is that you use to go ahead and, and manage that. Um, and, the, the big thing is that it's a relationship business. Uh, the industry has been dominated commercially by buyers and sellers, and that doesn't stop. They're still in negotiation, but you've got to run it through a process anyways. You're using email to do it. Um, you know, you're using text to do it. You're using fax to do it. So moving it from text or email and fax where you're trying to put all these things together and it's subject to time and, and manual error, you, know, you just put it through a system. Um, and that's the type of digital solutions that we need. Um, and, and that's what the Felixes are building. You know, I, there's a few others out there, so you know you got to pick the, the right platform or product for you. And then as a, uh, an operating business, um, really understanding your customers' needs, right? Really uh, understanding how you're solving for problems, you're making it easy, um, because there's a lot of distractions in today's world. So, and, and this, it's, it's really the, the market environment, too, that we're in. Um, you can't make your product without steel. And if you don't know when it's coming and you got to shut down your production because you don't have steel, that's a big issue. So um, you got to think differently. You, you got to adjust. Um, and that's what really COVID's done is it's gotten all of us to take a, a good look in the mirror and say, what are we doing and not doing in our businesses um, to make sure that we can survive these conditions. Very good. Let's, um, let's pivot a bit here to another topic that comes up a lot these days as a potential big step forward, but also where there's some perceived risk and also something that is top of mind from uh, some of the newer employees who come into the steel industry, which is sustainability. Uh, that's also an area where there's calls for innovation. And I think the question, which I'll throw to Scott, is whether or not we see any of Apologies for the noise in the background. Uh, whether or not we see any move in sustainability as a net positive or a net negative for the steel industry. One of the topics that comes up a lot is, will renewables, for example, as you pointed out, Todd, made with steel, um, the wind towers and everything else, will the renewable end of energy cannibalize the steel industry because there'll be reduced demand for seamless pipes, or will it be a net accretion or net incremental add to it? So I'll throw that to Scott. If you could comment, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go deep in a few of the subtopics. Yeah, so we, we definitely see growth in the renewable uh, sector uh, continuing to drive steel demand and, uh, going forward. Uh, we do not see, however, oil going away. Uh, for an example, with the, the recent winter storms that hit Texas, uh, we had the electric grid go down. Uh, we had a lot of wind turbines freeze up. Um, so again, we continue to see a push towards um, oil. 
uh, all those renewable sectors, hydrogen, um, wind, solar, uh, should end up being main drivers to steel going forward. But again, we, we don't see um, any major change towards OCTG or anything like that. So effectively, uh, it's a net addition because it creates more demand and uh, which, is, which creates more need for specialized products and supplies. As long as the government doesn't get in the way from being able to make those other products by restricting us from being able to do what we need when it comes to really building our infrastructure, sustaining it, like Scott was talking about in terms of, you know, you can't go all wind because it's not reliable. However, we're all for wind, we're all for solar, we're all for renewable, but you can't, it's not an all or none. Um, it, you know, you, you need both. Uh, and I, just one other comment on sustainability. I think it's funny because a lot of companies now are always trying to like push the new, you know, marketing message. And now, you know, sustainability is in. Um, and it's been in for a little while. I just think it's interesting because the steel industry has been working, at least the domestic steel industry, um, has been working towards sustainability for a long time. When you're talking about 70 plus percent of capacity made um, with a mini mill, you know, that's sustainability. Uh, recycling process. When you look at what the integrated mills, while being challenged financially, still have looked to invest in their facilities to then have a, a, a better footprint, um, that's sustainability. So, you know, I think sustainability actually has started with steel. Um, we just haven't marketed it as well. And I think the industry um, needs to do a better job of that, where all players need, need to take credit for, for that. Chris, do you want to comment before I jump back in with another question? Yeah, I was going to say, even the integrated blast furnace producers have done, taken steps to um, further their sustainability. We've seen U.S. Steel, with their Big River Steel acquisition, um, Cliffs moving into um, downstream and upstream um, products. Kind of, I mean, like you said 70% of the steel produced today is from electric arc furnace. It's some of the lowest carbon steel in the world. Um, so everybody's doing their part um, and helping with sustainability uh, domestically as well to help combat some of that push um, that's being heard around the world. It's, it's a fair point. The carbon footprint in terms of carbon produced by an EAF per ton of steel is, is very low uh, compared to some of the, let's let's call it more traditional routes, particularly outside the US. And there's been also a lot of moves in the integrated players to, uh, as hey, you Alex, said, how about the life cycle of steel too, right? So once steel's produced, the life cycle of steel. So don't just think about it at the point of production, think about it through the life cycle. The life cycle of steel is, is better than any other material in the world. Um, and the US has been the, the driver of uh, innovation when it comes to steel making. Um, so, you know, we, we believe that'll continue. Um, and the other thing is uh, carbon footprint is, is is not um, specific to uh, a location or a country. It's, it's everyone's planet. So to push it to China and then have them be uh, responsible for that isn't the answer. Um, by cutting back production here, uh, we're an industrial country. Um, we rely on it today, and we need to continue to be an industrial country, but do it in a smart way. Um, and and the U.S. has done that, and we could always get better, uh, and we'll continue to do that, but we can't be in denial that we, we don't share uh, the same planet, because we do. So when China goes to 900 million tons, and their environmental responsibility is different than ours, um, and then we think we're going to restrict things here to push it over there, um, they're going to probably be less responsible with it than us, just from history. Uh, so. I think that we need more capacity here, more production here. Um, that also is uh, capacity that's focused on, uh, you know, cleaner uh, energy and 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 cleaner air and and uh, a better footprint. Have any of your customers asked you for uh, the carbon footprint of the steel you're selling? Is that a demand topic that's come up at all? Something that we've seen a bit in Europe where some of the end customers have shareholders and they need to show the whole supply chain's uh, carbon footprint and they need to make a positive step forward to decarbonizing. Is that, is that something you've seen in your industry? Yeah, today, today very few, uh, hopefully a lot more in the future. Um, you know, one of the things that Majestic is, 
you know, we've always pushed that in terms of we buy domestic steel, we buy material from um, you know, top rated producers, we're buying recycled steel, uh, we're buying from integrateds that have done things to, to reduce the carbon footprint. So you know, we're always looking to, to speak about domestic, fair trade, recycled material, lower carbon footprint, um, but it hasn't necessarily stuck yet. But going back to my comments on um, how people are thinking today, I believe that we're going to see more interest from customers on that. Interesting. Um, very curious how this affects hot dip galvanized, especially. We're going to put up another slide and talk about where we think there's an interesting impact on the steel specifically that you sell and where you, you uh, specialize, which is HDG. Um, a lot of the questions from end customers and in the market as a whole that came up a few years ago were, how do we lightweight vehicles? So again, reduce the carbon footprint, use less carbon, et cetera. And there was a big push to aluminum. We certainly saw that in the Tesla Model S. We all know what happened with the F-150 in 2015. And there's a lot more structurals, i.e. long products going into cars that are made out of aluminum. Everything from crash management systems to uh, the battery boxes. However, we're seeing a bit of a shift back towards steel when it comes to flat products, particularly the closures, doors, roof, et cetera. And the slide that we're showing, which is the Tesla Model 3, makes this very clear. Tesla went back to steel. Uh, and this we're seeing across the board. And when we talk to the automakers, they tell us, look, unless we've already retooled our supply chain, it's easier to stick with what we know. So I guess one of the questions we've also had is, how do we think the whole sustainability debate will affect the products that you sell and where uh, you are very, very deeply specialized? Now, I'll throw that to Todd, and then uh, I'm going to ask a couple other questions about zinc, um, and then we'll move to the topic you raised, which was trade. So to you, Todd. Yeah, and at Majestic, we're not against aluminum, but steel is stronger, it's safer, and it's more cost effective. Um, so from that perspective, we'll always push steel in, in that regard because who knows if our future gets us more into the aluminum business. Um, so, you know, I don't want to comment on that. However, uh, I always think about it in terms of the end user and the application. And I would just much rather drive in a car that's made with steel than aluminum. Um, you know, I don't mind aluminum can for my beer, my Coke, uh, but probably not for my car. Um, just my two cents if you're, if you're curious. Uh, and, you know, we're going to see more demand for coated steel, right? What does it do? It, it's, it's, um, it's coated with zinc. It's coated with aluminum. It's coated with magnesium. It's greater corrosive resistance. Um, and we all need greater corrosive, corrosive resistance in today's world. So, you know, we see a greater push of applications that um, were not coated before moving towards uh, coated products, which is why, you know, we, we are a, a proponent of um, coated carbon steel. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't handle cold rolled or hot rolled or stainless or aluminum. I always call those the condiments. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, coated carbon steel is, is, is the best there is out there. And, and um, that's why, you know, we focus on that. Now, you know, for certain applications, obviously hot roll does the job. Cold roll does the job. It doesn't need to be coated. Um, but anytime it's coated, um, you know, it's just going to be more durable and, and, and handle more. So, um, you know, all, all for carbon coated steel. Yeah, we, we see some increased demand for zinc as a result over the next five years. Probably okay now. Uh, Have you been taking zinc since, uh, since COVID? Uh, do, you, do you take zinc yourself, Alex? Uh, as a vitamin, yes, or as a mineral, rather, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so price is up. Uh, even my daily pill costs more. Supply is, um, supply tried, is tight. To, mm -hmm. Sorry? Supply is tight. Yeah, haven't tried to crush it down and coat any steel myself, but I think we're going to have some issues in the next few years. And our, my colleagues in McKinsey's Basic Materials Insights group has been, have been tracking this pretty closely. And they're thinking maybe five years out, a bit of a shortfall, but it'll be a good time for HDG, particularly in the auto industry. Last question about sustainability. I'll, I'll send it to Scott or anyone else who wants to comment. Um, do we see any risk of a carbon tax coming in or stricter, stronger uh, sort of environmental regulations that will affect steel making, kind of the CARB regulations in California going national. Scott, feel free to, to comment or anyone else wants to pick up on that one. Chris, we'll take that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment. Um, when people think about carbon tax or um, different issues, it's always seemed as a negative. But if you go back to trade, like we talked about domestically um, with over 70% and growing, 
of our domestic steel production is from an EAF, some of the lowest carbonized steel in the world. Um, we've all agreed that from the beginning that blanket Section 232 tariff isn't the end-all, be-all, and there's going to be opportunities to um, kind of adjust that as we move along. And one of the possibilities to kind of combat a possible um, carbon tax domestically would be switching some of that import tax to high carbon steel imports. Um, more specific products from specific countries that, um, that could be targeted where you're not just a blanket tariff across the board, but it kind of does two, two things at once. Puts the emphasis back on that country of production with the high carbon steel to go farther into sustainability, move down the line, um, but also reward some of the domestic uh, production that is taking those steps um, on the sustainability side. That's a very interesting point. We've been trying to track this as well. And obviously we don't do policy recommendations, but if we stare at a crystal ball, you can imagine a scenario where there's a low carbon trading corridor across the US, Europe, and other countries that invest in, again, low carbon steel. And it will obviously have secondary and tertiary implications because you're gonna get into a situation where you see up, upstream in the supply chain needing to show the carbon of every input to the furnace. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting point. I think that the, where I'm coming out, just listening to the three of you on this topic, and I'll, I'll throw this back to Todd, is it doesn't sound like we need to be afraid of sustainability in the steel industry. It sounds like it's actually an opportunity, uh, and particularly in, in the U.S. steel industry. So I'm just wondering if that's the right conclusion, because a lot of people we talk to, they, they have this fear factor. And one of the points we've been, we've been emphasizing is, look, this is an opportunity for new partnership. It's an opportunity for new products. It's an opportunity actually to continue to support domestic steel production. Again, not making a policy recommendation. Uh, to you, Todd, if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it just goes back to how you define sustainability within your business, how you've prepared for sustainability, and what action the government takes. Um, so from our perspective, you know, I think of you know, coated carbon made from recycled steel as, as very sustainable. Um, so you know, we buy a lot of steel from mini mills. We buy you know, primarily coated product. So you know, I think that's a very sustainable um, solution. Uh, you know, so it just it depends on how you're defining it. Uh, I think about sustainability in terms of life cycle um, versus at one single point of the process. Uh, but everyone defines it differently. So um, going to the government's definition, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what I think the administration is going to do, what the state of California is going to do, what the state of Ohio is going to do. Um, however, we are prepared for changes. Um, and we do believe that we could see um, different uh, decisions made at a, at a national level and also a, a state and a local level. And you know, we operate um, in, in many states and we ship to every state. Um, so you know, we just prepare for that. And then we, we adjust as uh, needed. I mean, we've adjusted through different administrations in the past. Um, and so you know, we always believe in a, a pro-business environment. Um, but also, you know, doing the right thing is a core value to us. So sustainability is a part of uh, Majestic. So, you know, to answer your question, I, I see it more as a positive as long as it's not used um, where it's politicized or weaponized to restrict. Um, if it's used to grow, it's, it's used to build, it's used to protect, it's used to support, then absolutely. Um, so, you know, we'll see how things play out when it comes to, to that from a government perspective versus an actual uh, industry perspective. Great. And last question on trade. And I know this has come up before, but it's one that everyone always asks. And it's whether or not we think there's any uh, reality to Section 232 going away or being softened. We saw a few um, changes last year and reversals when it came to aluminum, particularly uh, upstream aluminum. But the question is whether there's going to be any changes to 232 and steel in the next few months, if any of you have a perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I was um, closely involved with the last administration. I have not been with this administration. However, everything that I've seen and read um, shows support for Section 232. Um, my belief is, as, as Scott mentioned, is there's a need for imports in the US based upon our current capacity and demand. Um, ideally, those are fair traded. 
there's also you know, anti-dumping and countervailing duties uh, above and beyond 232. Uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, 232 is not an end-all, be-all. Um, and the current um, you know, way that it's defined um, is, is somewhat of a generalization across the entire market. And so I've always thought that it needs to be evolved based upon decisions that are America first um, in terms of making sure that we're protecting um, industry and protecting jobs without um, creating an environment that doesn't support fair trade. So, you know, it needs to be evolved. We're going through a transition of the administration, so I don't see any short-term changes. I would believe that in the next four years, um, we will see some evolution of 232. The biggest thing is, you know, the, the U.S. Is, is a leader in the market when it comes to, um, really, when you, when you think about the steel industry, right, we're, we're a leader in the market. We're not the largest anymore. We're a small percentage of the whole, but we're still a leader in the market. Uh, so typically, the U.S. market uh, creates more of the ceiling versus the floor in terms of pricing while you know, others might create the floor. And, and we know that China has created the floor historically. You know, if you look at the current market, the floor is higher and the ceiling is higher. Um, and the floor and the ceiling have the ability to, to adjust. Um, so I think we always have to make sure that we are uh, putting policy in place to um, support domestic industry and jobs um, without Overprotecting that it actually can be detrimental. So you know we'll we'll see how it plays out. But uh, the the short answer there is I think in the short term 232 is here to stay. Uh, I don't think we'll see much change. Maybe just some small changes within um, the exclusion process. Uh, but over time it'll evolve. Very good. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, what's happening in the current markets? The push into digital questions about sustainability and trade, specifically how your end customers are reacting. As we round out this discussion, let's look forward. Uh, what you're gonna be tracking in the next month, two months, six months, where you think the steel industry and particularly coated steel is facing some headwinds. We know the tailwinds, uh, pricing is great. Yes, it's a supply constrained market, but I think as was commented earlier, uh, the upstream manufacturers are really focusing on, let's say, a more customized, bespoke approach for their end clients. So there's a lot of fast moving action by the steel industry. And just to make one plug for an industry I've personally worked in a long time and love, metals companies are actually some of the most innovative out there. And they act because they live in a world of constant volatility and change and a lot of risk, they actually are able to pivot and respond a lot faster to changes. So what are each of you thinking about the next month, three months till the end of the year as the most dangerous and also the most interesting opportunities and uh, challenges and opportunities that are coming. Maybe we'll go left to right from my perspective, starting with Scott. Yeah, this is, we still strictly believe this is a supply driven market. Uh, so over these next few months, we're definitely gonna be keeping an eye on that. Like I mentioned earlier, we wanna see how uh, the capacity situation ends up uh, evolving over these next couple months. Uh, imports, uh, all the new tonnage coming online and offline, uh, just seeing how that interacts with pricing. Uh, we don't want to have, obviously, the market crash if we bring on too much capacity uh, and we see pricing drop, you know, 100% or 80%. Um, so that's really the main thing that uh, Chris, Todd, and I are going to be focusing on these next couple months. Got it. Go to you, Todd. Yeah, we uh, like risks ahead, volatility, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, at Majestic, we live in the middle of it, right? We need to support our, our suppliers at the same time, make sure we're taking care of our customers, keeping them competitive and keeping them uh, informed in the market, making sure that they have steel timely and, and, and quality product. So from our perspective, we're always watching everything. Uh, it's a global market. Um, we live in a domestic um, focused industry right now, given the current environment, but it's really regional and local. Right, so um, when you have added capacity coming in Texas, how does that impact Maine? Probably not. Um, does it impact the overall market? Of course. Uh, so you know we're always tracking everything. That's part of the value add that we provide for our customers. And just know that everything's subject to change. So you know while we're saying what we're saying right now, um, 
if uh, iron ore mine goes down in Australia, that has an impact here in the market based upon raw material costs. So it's, it's a supply chain that's global, that's connected um, across the world. However, it's impacted at a local level. So who could have planned for uh, the weather in the, in the south? I mean, you know, we, we can't plan for that. Um, so like you said, metals companies have to be agile, have to be innovative, have to make adjustments. So right now, what are we planning for? We're planning for a market with tight supply, strong demand, and um, current government support in terms of uh, making sure that we can continue to operate our businesses. Government's gonna make decisions, we'll adjust. Mother Nature is gonna make decisions, we'll adjust. Uh, other players in our industry are going to make decisions. We'll adjust. However, at Majestic, we look to lead, um, lead by example, um, and, and hopefully the industry as a whole, I believe all tides rise together, so hopefully all tides rise um, in, in that regard. But the, the market environment we're in right now, um, we don't believe prices are going to go up forever. We know they're elevated. Uh, right now, the current price environment is market-driven uh, and supply-driven, as Scott said. It's not cost-driven. Um, however, costs are higher, so the floor is higher. So don't expect a, a massive correction if you have higher scrap, higher iron ore, higher zinc. Um, you know, so you know, just follow it. And if you if you don't want to follow it that closely, um, that's okay too. We understand you have to focus on your business as a manufacturer and and taking care of what you do. And that's why we do what we do. You know, we 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 focus on being an expert in steel. Um, in terms of the market, but also in distribution processing, value-added solutions, digital solutions, and, and, and quality relationships, so. Great, and to you, Chris. Um, personally, I think the most exciting thing is demand. Um, January flat rolled consumption was up 35% from where we bottomed in May, uh, but we're still 10, 15% where, below where we were this time last year. Uh, what mm -hmm. happens the back half of the year? Um, we're starting to get, inch towards see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, more and more businesses, uh, industries are opening up domestically and globally. Uh, what's that do for consumption? Is there, I tend to believe there's gonna be a slingshot forward. Um, we're getting a third stimulus um, that's hitting the economy within the next few weeks. Um, we saw with the first one, almost all of it went into savings. The second one went straight into Target, Walmart, um, other retail stores. Uh, consumption. Yep, the third one's gonna do exactly the same and it's the biggest one yet. Um, so with the slowdown in auto, it's only gonna kick that can down the road farther. Other key sectors, residential, um, appliance, ag, everything pointing to strong growth this year. So I'm most interested to see what that does the back half of the year. Does that start to elevate um, as that new production's coming online? Is there fur further uh, places for that material to go? And there's a lot of demand to be had. We need a lot of uh, new manufacturing, new construction, infrastructure. Uh, the 1920s were coined the Roaring Twenties, and at Majestic, we're calling it the Soaring Twenties, um, <laughs> where we believe that uh, you'll be sore, and guess what, when you work out, being sore is a good thing. However, we believe the market's gonna soar, and there's a, a, a bull market behind us, um, and we believe that the market will continue to, to get better. Um, however, there's, there's waves. It's not a, a flat line that just goes a uh, hockey stick up. Very good. We're just about at time. I think we're also very excited about these trends and particularly some of the underlying capabilities that have to be built to respond to them, whether it's the digital trend or encouraging people in their 20s and 30s to go into the metals industry or to go into, let's call it, a technology industry that has led and led in this country many, many uh, decades. So uh, with that, I think we can round out at about uh, a minute before time with thanks to all three of you. Uh, pass back to Todd if you want to say some concluding words. Yeah, we appreciate everyone that's taken the time to participate in this webinar. As Alex said at the beginning, if you have any questions, uh, hopefully you asked them throughout and we'll follow up. Uh, or even after the fact, reach out to anyone uh, at Majestic or Alex, um, who's an expert in the space. You know, we're really here to help. Um, that's what we, we do. Uh, you know, we're a believer in, in the market, we're a believer in the economy, and um, you know, we want to see a strong steel industry, uh, and we want to see a strong market. So thank you all for your time. Have a great day, and keep building.